Uh, so thank you for joining us this evening. I am Nada Raza, the curatorial advisor to the Al Sarkal Arts Foundation. Uh, this is our second digital program for the exhibition New Waves, Muhammad Milehi and the Casablanca Art School Archives, curated by uh, Murad Muntazami of Zaman Books. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping, if you could keep your microphone on mute if you're not speaking and also keep your phones on silent. Uh, the format this evening will be a discussion uh, chaired by Murad, uh, who will just introduce uh, Muhammad Milehi and the filmmaker Shalom Gorovitz. Um, it's a really special evening for us. Um, because uh, it's a reunion um, for Shalom and Malehi after 36 years since the film was made on the occasion of uh, an exhibition at the Bronx Museum of Arts. And as you may have overheard, we have the then director of the museum also amongst us today. So over to you, Murad. And of course, as usual, we'll, we'll, after the discussion, we'll have an opportunity for questions from the audience. If you could either raise your hand and we'll allow you to speak, or if you're more comfortable, you can type in your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nada. And thank you uh, to everyone uh, for attending this um, very special event. Uh, I'm honored to, to be in presence of uh, Mr. Mohamed Melehi, who is sitting next to me. We're uh, speaking from Paris um, in the framework of uh, the exhibition, as Nada kindly reminded, uh, Mohamed Melehi and the Casablanca Art School Archives that we entitled New Waves, in obvious reference to Melehi's uh, main uh, pattern and uh, kind of uh, visual signature uh, to do a very brief presentation of uh, Mr. Melehi, uh, since there is already a lot that we've discussed with the audience in this digital form and provided on Al Cercal's website as you know exhibition leaflets, uh, additional archives that everybody can go and and explore online. I will just remind that uh, Mr. Melehi is a Moroccan artist uh, who happened to travel to different European countries, uh, Spain, Italy, throughout the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s, and also traveled uh, significantly to New York City, especially between 1962 and 1964 when Mr. Melehi was actually, among other events, uh, took part in an exhibition at the, the MoMA in New York in 1963, an exhibition of hard edge and geometric painting. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Melehi's career uh, developed throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, up until today, and mostly known for a very broad scope of practices and, and, and medias uh, such as painting, sculpture, mural, uh, painting, uh, graphic design, and even architectural works are uh, integrated uh, plastic arts to architectural spaces, as we will explore again uh, throughout this conversation. And we're very happy to, to be able to to set up this conversation between Mr. Melehi and Shalom Gorevitz, who I really thank for his presence with us tonight. Shalom Gorevitz is a video artist, but shares very common ground with Melehi as someone with a deep pedagogic uh, experience and uh, teaching experience um, since the 80s until now. Um, we will come back on how Shalom Gorevitz and Mr. Melehi's uh, encounter happened in New York in, in anticipation of the 1984 uh, retrospective of Melehi in the Bronx Museum of the Arts, which was 20 years after his 1963 participation in a MoMA exhibition. And for this second chapter of Melehi's relationship with New York City, Shalom Gorevitz would happen a very important character. So I will also remind that uh, Shalom 
was uh, studying video art uh, since the end of the 60s. And uh, Shalom Gorevitz, uh, beside the fact that he's an accomplished video artist who has uh, many artworks in the MoMA collection and other international collection, is still teaching today uh, at Ramapo College uh, Liberal School of Arts in, in New Jersey. So that's for the presentation of our two guests. And I assume that most of our, oh, sorry, I also would like to mention for some of you who, who would um, join a few minutes ago that we are also honored by uh, the former Bronx Museum of the Arts director, Louis Cancel, who had invited Melehi for this 1984 uh, retrospective um, and also testifies for the kind of uh, avant-garde uh, program of the Bronx Museum of the Arts, even locally at the scale of the United States, you know, putting forward an artist from Morocco, which was somehow considered as the first or one of the first ever uh, sing, uh, solo exhibition of a North African artist in New York. I'm talking about the Mr. Cancel's invitation to Melehi in 1984. Um, so maybe I will now begin the, the conversation between Melehi and Gorovitz. Uh, Shalom, I, I know there would be so much to tell about this, um, this also this scope of time that uh, has passed since you didn't met with Melehi. It's now 35 years after this uh, documentary that you made. Um, maybe I could begin by asking you um, of this coincidence, which is quite astonishing, that you were an, a resident at the Bronx Museum of the Arts in, in, you know, around beginning of the 80s when Melehi came to prepare his exhibition at the, the Bronx Museum of the Arts and you were commissioned to make a documentary film about this artist that was about to be highlighted in a, in a New York museum. But from our primary conversation, I was astonished to hear that the wave pattern as Malehi's uh, overflowing pattern, uh, as you discovered, was something already embedded in your own work, actually as a video artist who was trained with figures like Nam Jun Paik, who was apparently already working in wave compositions, which meant literally to produce waves forms and wavy patterns on TV screens or video uh, electronics. Uh, and I would be thrilled maybe for you to give us an insight into this peculiar time of your uh, entrance into the video art scene that uh, actually made you a kind of uh, another practitioner of the wave, which was totally unexpected, I guess, to meet someone who would mainly paint the same pattern, but from, a, from the other side of the world, let's say. We would be really happy to hear you about that wave coincidence. Please, Shalom. You have to unmute, Shalom, sorry. Yeah. OK. Um... First, I uh, would like to thank everybody, uh, the guests who are joining us and the people who are sitting in front of me and uh, Murad for rediscovering the video and uh, looking at it. Um, I especially want to again thank Luis, who is a visionary and an activist and uh, just having a video artist as the uh, artist in residence at the Bronx Museum was a big statement. Uh, relative to his being you know, very uh, progressive and forward thinking about art. So, um, and that he had faith in me to uh, send me over to Morocco as a one man <laughs> band kind of uh, with very heavy equipment. And uh, I really appreciate that. And it meant a lot to my career and uh, my life was, uh, life-changing, certainly. Um, Malahi, uh, wow, just 
you know, first I would say all the credit goes to Malahi for organizing the journey and um, how lucky I was to be part of it, and how much I learned uh, because of this project and uh, how it stayed with me all of these years, certainly uh, as anything that I was doing before was amplified by my experience of uh, watching you work and hearing about your work and uh, having that kind of intensive relationship. And um, if you want, I could show you a few of the tools that uh, myself and colleagues were using at the Experimental Television Center. And I could say a few words about the, uh, about the wave an electronic. Uh... Yeah, we would love that. Thank you, Shalom. These are images from the material that you and the apparels that you were using since the beginning of the 70s, right? Right. Do, can you see this? It's, yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah, this is an overview. I'll just make this into a, a slideshow, hopefully. This was uh, one of Nam June Paik's earliest inventions. He had a great sense of humor like Malahi, and he called it a wobulator. And uh, it actually changes the, uh, the shape of whatever is going through it. You can see the inside of the wobulator, how it's uh, basically been taken apart and put back together with a few extra cables. The, uh, the top of this uh, unit is the original Namjoon Paik uh, image processor and synthesizer. And it's all based on waveforms, on uh, generating waveforms that then change different parts of the television signal. So, incredible. And I should also, I mean, so, so basically at that time, the wave pattern was not only an internal effect or vibrancy, as, I, as far as I understand, it was also a visual pattern literally appearing on those screens, right? Like yeah. literally producing wavy, almost as paintings, but electronic paintings in a way. Right. Because everything was controllable. So you can go from just a slight buzzing kind of feeling to something where it's, everything is moving and, and then you can superpose it over something else that's moving in another direction. So yeah, it's all based on uh, the three uh, basic waves. And that's what I was seeing Malahi do, you know, in a physical way. And it was really fascinating. So, so it's the kind of experience that you were also uh, doing by the time you met with Melehi, because I guess you met slightly before the 1984 exhibition. So I'm not sure if you met in 83 or 84, but apparently you met, you first met in New York because Melehi would travel to New York for preparing his exhibition, I think. And after that first meeting, I think then you, you organized to, to travel to Morocco together. Do you have some memories of that, of that time, Shalom? Sure, I mean, uh, I guess I became aware uh, that Luis was planning this exhibition and we must have talked about it and he might have some better memories than I do about it. But um, the idea of having a video that would give some context to the work so people could see, you know, the spaces, the public spaces and the uh, private collections and get a feel for um, just the general uh, atmosphere of Morocco and uh, the culture as it relates to Malahi's work. So um, it was meant to complement his work and to give, to allow him to speak actually about his work to anyone who was coming into the museum. So that's that. I mean, we should insist, insist maybe to our audience that indeed the film that you were commissioned by the Bronx Museum of Arts was literally shown at the beginning of Melehi exhibition when people would, before people would enter the exhibition at the Bronx Museum of Arts, your film was 
screened in the entrance as a as a kind of a cultural uh, reference then for for the viewer to then enter the exhibition right all right if you would allow me a second yes, to of course with pleasure <laughs> to provide some historical context. Of course. So, so um, uh, Mohammed Malehi and Mohammed bin Isa had for several years in the early 80s uh, organized an international arts festival that took place in Asila, their native town, in the month of August. And I don't know how I was invited, but somehow I was invited along with a, a whole slew of other international artists and curators and um, you know over the course of several years and several visits I became aware of a lot of Moroccan talent and of course you know uh, Malehi's work was you know right at the top so it, it really it really coincided with um, the vision that we had that the Bronx Museum in the early 80s really wanted to be a kind of a portal, uh, a, an entryway for artists from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And so Malehi was one of the first artists that I was able to invite to re have a, a, a retrospective, a one-person show, major one-person show in New York City. Because at the time, New York City, I mean, uh, you know, Malehi in his uh, 1964 exhibition with MoMA, was a super pioneer and one of the one of the outliers, let's say, uh, artists who who would have that visibility. But for the most part, New York, which was the cultural capital of the world, was closed to a lot of the contemporary artists from all these other regions. So um, we were fortunate at the Bronx Museum at that time in the early '80s to have artists like Shalom Gorowitz as an artist in residence. And so it was, it was clear in my mind uh, that if we were able to, you know, send uh, Shalom to Morocco with, a, you know, the curator, Philip Verri, who was the chief curator at the time, and he was serving as the curator for Malehi's exhibition, that we would be able to have a documentary video that could give a lot of context to the work of Malehi. And, so, and that's exactly what we ended up having because of the, uh, the great skill and, and vision of Shalom um, and the organizing uh, that took place by Belehi and other Moroccans, we were able to create a fabulous contextual film that then enriched the great exhibition that we that we did there. So thank you very much. And now I will let the artists continue to speak. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Thank Kenzo. you, Luis. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's thanks to you. But uh, if you allow me here to just uh, mention in the memory of a friend of ours is Bob Blackburn, a black artist, American artist who used to run the largest uh, printmaking workshop in New York. And all the artists who came in residence or visited New York to know about printmaking, they had to go to Bob Blackburn's uh, workshop. So thanks to Bob, he mentioned to me your name and who you are, who you were at that time. So we invited you, Vanessa and I, we decided to invite you among other artists, international artists from all the world. And that's what the real good beginning of Asila as a pioneer to in the third world or in the southern countries to show how we could use art in terms of the way of communication and, and bringing people to, to think in a different way, in a positive way. For us, it was really a discovery to, to put Morocco on the, on the international scene. And that's thanks to you, thanks to Sh Shalom. So when Shalom was shooting the, the film, I was, you know, like shivering inside of mine because when I, disco I discovered photography when I was uh, in my adolescence years and my father bought the camera for me and uh, just was it the first camera produced by Kodak Eastman. 
I, I don't, then it's a sort of Bronica or uh, boy. So to me, painting was, had to do with, with photography. So when I went to study in the European academies, my mind was always turned to photography. And then I, I always dreamed to, to be some, some, a person involved with the visual, visual arts in terms of filmmaking, you know, in the, in the 40s and the 50s, Hollywood pictures were very determinant in our mind at that time and dreams for the future. So when I saw Shalom shooting my film, I, I could, uh, uh, you know, close my eyes and figure out that it's me who is doing the work. <laughs> this is, this is a, a later statement for, for you, Shalom. And the thing I loved also is to have an American by the name Shalom, who was a Jewish person, and I am an, an Arab person. And Morocco was really the country where Jews and Muslims cohabitated throughout history. We had Jews in Morocco since 2000 years ago, you know, and they were converted to Berber and Amazigh habits, they, they spoke Berber. Anyway, the, the Shalom with me in those land of Berber people, Berber culture was a very important thing. So this was really not, not intentionally done, but it was to give Shalom the opportunity to see what, what, what shape of an Arab atmosphere could be. As a New Yorker, he, you know, he could he couldn't have an, a real idea about our world and how we deal with different cultures and different religions. That was very important, and I, I am sure that Shalom recognized this that opportunity. And thanks to Luis to have gathered these different sources in a different moment in a very a very special period. The sixties were a very important period for for culture, for the, for the arts. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, now it, it, turns, it, it turns like a nostalgic, you know, movement and, and era. So going to the, the wavy shape, it's very important. First thing when I went to the United States at that time, don't, you know, the, the first ideas about, abstract wavy communication was the, the tape, the tape that can speak, you know. In the late 50s, we happened to, to know what is the tape, you know. So when I wrote, when I showed my work, first time I wrote about my, my paintings, I compared my paintings to, to the tapes, you know. <laughs> tapes for the music and then also for the squares right well, well the square that well the, the beginning was the you know i remember at least uh, lewis drove me the first time throughout manhattan uh, highways by night and you can have the 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 best and the unique landscape you can ever see is to ride east side east side west side manhattan you know in the car and looking at the buildings like monsters with, with the lighting eyes, that's, and that reminded me of the perforated cards, IBM, and the IBM used perforated cards. And it was the time we, we, we that's the painting I, I have showed, show, showed at the MoMA was, is entitled IBM. Right, I it's did. it's a it's a painting that it's now in the Doha, Doha Museum of Modern Art collection, collection yeah. entitled IBM. And the IBM cards you refer yeah. to were basically a rectangle yeah. shape that somehow proportional yeah. to a canvas with square holes yeah. like yes, this within the card. Right. Yeah, it's it's like well anyway. And uh, when I was in New York, I uh, I had in mind what did happen to. Piet Mondrian in, in Manhattan while dri driving and painting his works in square shapes. 
anyway, there is a lot to say about this period. So I don't want to take uh, all the time for me. No, no, I think it's great. I mean, we already have so many elements to try to point out. I mean, from what you were discussing with uh, Louis Cancel, I think there, there would be much to say because it means that there was somehow a kind of absolutely organic relationship between Asila and New York. Because among the people that you invited to the Asila Festival of the Arts were uh, people from the American scene. I mean, people that, from a lot of different countries, from from Lebanon, from Tunisia, yeah, Middle East, uh, from Middle general East, Middle East and North Africa, Africa, Latin America, Latin America, yeah. and also people from New York, like Bob Blackburn, yes. uh, Mohammed Omar Khalil, Khalil yes. I think, and these were Sudanese origin uh, Black American artists from yes. New York scene, right? Yes. And I. So that, that really completes the kind of organic network also through Mr. Cancel that played actually in between Asila and New York in a, yes. in a very objective and, and concrete ways. I mean, so th this was definitely a fascinating uh, element and also in terms of solidarity movements and how the third world countries and artists actually came up together between such different cities like Asila and New York. Yeah. Paradoxical comparison. Asila is only 30,000 inhabitants, while New York uh, are 12 million. So <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, those are the things to be compared. Exactly. You know? uh, and Shalom, I think also it would be great to hear of your feeling of when you traveled to Morocco, because Mr. Melehi was speaking about how he got influenced somehow or how he absorbed some of the New York landscape and some of the kind of Western new technologies. But you, on the contrary, got to absorb everything that you saw in Morocco. As you were telling us, Melehi was actually the one who would organize the travel because you had to, to, to go to many cities. You had to go to Casablanca, to Marrakech, to to you know, play between the urban and the rural, mm -hmm. then locations where Melehi's integrated works would be like the famous Banque Populaire in Rabat or other official buildings in Casablanca where his paintings were integrated in entrance halls and that you uh, wonderfully captured in your film. But I would like to, to hear you because there is so many elements from this kaleidoscope of influences from Morocco, because from there you had to grasp not only the Islamic, but also the pre-Islamic with Berber and Amazir painted ceilings, which is the, the magnificent conclusion of your film with the painted ceilings in the rural mosques. But there's also so many influence in Morocco that extend only you know Islamic architecture. So we would be glad to hear you, Shalom, about how this kaleidoscope of of influence from a very diverse Moroccan landscape and how you absorbed it as a as a filmmaker. Well, the film I guess speaks for itself in terms of you know just we were um, carrying around amazingly heavy equipment. I think we even had lights with huge batteries and um, if it wasn't for uh, Abdul Qadir Laraj and a few other uh, great artists, uh, I don't know how we would have done it, but um, everything, you know, the camera was large and I would give uh, Malahi, you know, the credit is really the director and writer <laughs> basically and, you know, I've, I said that before but um, I didn't know that he had the fantasy of being the director, but in this case, that was the wise thing for me to do is, you know, listen to the master. This is his story. I wanted him to be happy, you know, and uh, yeah, as a Jewish person, um, it was really like going back to my roots in a way. It was a very, it was very stirring for me to be in North Africa and feeling, you know, this is where my people come from too. And this is how people are living here, their normal lives. And 
I always appreciated Morocco's uh, progressive stance towards Israel. And um, so uh, there's this, a saying that I'll uh, paraphrase, when the Arab smiled at the Jew, the Jew smiled back. And uh, so, you know, I, I just felt so welcome. And, you know, there was never, I never felt in any way that my name or my, uh, where I was coming from. And do you, and do you remember specifically the first time that Mr. Melehi take you in one of these rural and very poor uh, traditional sure. mosques when these incredible painted ceilings would appear yeah. to your eyes? And because the way you captured those painted ceilings is probably one of the best uh, testimony for this element of a quite hid, almost hidden visual culture. And I know that these painted ceilings are of tremendous importance for Melehi's development, but also for the way you approach the film, because it happens as the conclusion of the film with a beautiful uh, statement by Melehi. I, I'm just curious the, about the first time that Melehi took you in there. Well, uh, we were uh, based in Marrakesh, and we had a driver with a big van, and uh, we'd go and we'd have to park somewhere at the bottom of the hill or the mountain, it seemed like a mountain, and just walk up uh, dirt paths, carrying all the heavy equipment and the whole entourage of people that we were traveling with. And you could kind of almost sense that the people in the village were killing the chickens and the other things that they were going to feed us. And uh, I mean, everything in Morocco had to be, uh, we had to tell some authorities exactly where we were going to be at exactly what time. This was Moroccan rules. So everything that we did, you know, was more or less uh, prepared by Malahi, um, organized, you know, so that we wouldn't get hassle while we were doing it. But the people in these villages knew that we were coming and uh, they treated us with tremendous hospitality. And I really learned something about, you know, Abrahamic uh, hospitality. And um, then seeing these amazing uh, mosques that was just, you know, kind of mind blowing. And then I remember we actually added the soundtrack afterwards, probably while we were watching it, so that uh, Malahi could talk specifically about what we were seeing and, um, and kind of translate it. And then you can loop back, I guess, to, uh, to then look again at his work and see, wow, yeah, this was a very transformative experience for him. There is, there is something really beautiful that you say, Mr. Melehi, about the painted ceilings. When we hear your voice at the end of Shalom's editing, you say that these painted ceilings are on the one hand modern for their inventiveness, and on the other hand, they were also preserved from modernity because they were remote from the moderni modernization of the city and this paradox that the, the, they're modern, but at the same time, they were preserved from modernity. Well, this, you know, this kind of things happen to be discovered by, by chance. Uh, actually, who discovered these sailings in the Atlas Mountains is a friend of mine, a, a Dutch person who chose to live in Morocco. And he's still living in Morocco, in Marrakesh, and he's running a sort of private museum on a traditional popular production of art, mostly Berbers of the regions. So he, he was to me and to, to all of us like an explorer. So first time I went to see this very uh, modest, very simple mosques built with mud, what you, you call it in in America, Adobe, <clears throat> you know. So, but these ceilings made on, on wood, on palm trees, wood, so on, beautiful. I, I, I hope you have seen of them in the, in the documentary by uh, spontaneous artists. Well, we can date these uh, ceilings now about 130 or 20 years, you know, over them. So, we saw them like 
40, almost 40 years or 60 years, but they were existing before. <clears throat> so they, they, it was a big discovery. And this discovery played a big role for, for me firstly, and my friend Bert Flint, who, who I took him for a period to teach art history at the Casablanca School of Art. And through this sort of testimony, we could show our students that modern art, it's not, exclusively for advanced societies. Modern art, you can find it even in the remote societies in the traditional and rural society. Modern art is with us all the time. And this was a really big discovery. When you see this, the painting of the ceiling, you find all the movement of the Bauhaus painters. I'm speaking about painters, not architects. The, 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 the couple, the Delones, the Kandinsky, the, the uh, Herbert Bayer, all, you know, now I don't remember all the, 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 the important artists, but, you know, so this, it, it was for us like a link to, to establish a connection between modern and traditional art in different societies. And Morocco, Morocco was kept like a treasure because as you may know, all the Arab world and Islamic world in the, in the Mediterranean space has been under Ottoman ruling for almost eight centuries, except Morocco. The Turks they never could make hold of Morocco. I'm sorry to go to politics, this is historical. So Morocco has kept its tradition of traditional art, but don't forget, Morocco was the door for Africa to jump on west of Morocco. And it was the door for Europeans to enter Africa. So it was, and it still is a crossroad place where these two cultures and civilization meet, African and Southern Europeans and Europeans. See, so don't forget that all the Islamic culture in Spain fled to Morocco. Muslims and Jews were kicked out of Spain from Toledo, from Granada, from Cordoba. So they, they bring with them the tradition of almost eight, eight, seven or eight centuries in Spain, what is the Andalusian culture, and it's still living in Morocco. At that time, Fez was the capital of the Western Islamic world with the oldest university in the, in the world, this Qarawiyan. It's, it's a university that has been, by the way, built by a lady. Fatima al she she deposited all her belongings to, to, to build this university in the 10th century. You know, it's very, very, it has almost almost 11 centuries, this university, and it used to train a lot of scholars from the world. So I, I insist in, in, this, in this element to, to communicate to the, to the audience. You cannot make this distinction between this and that, even if we are living in a complete period of internet, you know, with these big firms, Google and whatsoever, you know, the, the past, the remote past, it's still present and it's still beating in us like our heart, you know. And you cannot build and continue building culture without having relationship or a link with the past. This past still has to teach us, teach us lots of things. If we, if we scratch, you know, if we scratch, we might find lots of, uh, lots of important things. So uh, Morocco, it's there. You are welcoming all of you to visit Morocco. It's, it's a sample of uh, uh, traditional art and culture. And it's still kept not, not completely uh, deformed or destroyed. In the, in, the, in the documentary, if you can watch this old, ancient architecture made of mud with a lot of engraving in the mud 
and decorations. That means the people need, they had the need to, to give their eyes something to, to, to read. Abstract, in a way, abstractly. I'm not talking about to read. Through. No, but that's exactly yeah. the same when you talk about the painted ceilings and you talk about the patterns as pieces of literature. Indeed. Even if it's yeah, painting, you call them pieces of literature yeah. because it has to do also with the way those artisans and grassroots artists would actually yeah. memorize this pattern or tell a story. Yeah, yeah. I would pattern. like I would like to add something here because I, I always uh, preach this idea. I discovered my own culture and civilization going to the other people. It's, it's in the West where I discover who I am. If I had remained in my own country, I wouldn't know anything about my culture. And to, I would add to this is when I discovered, it happens to everybody. You know, the 60s was the period where, for instance, if you go to the United States, students at the university, they will talk to you about Kumaraswamy. Now nobody talks about Kumaraswamy. After Kumaraswamy came uh, the, 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 the Zen Buddhism, you see? And the 80s come Dr. Uh, Dr. Castaneda. You see, the, the, these are evolutions in culture and through literature. Now, when I read about Zen, I discovered that- About yeah, Zen, Zen, Zen philosophy. Zen philosophy, you, don't, you, you, are not, you, should, you are not obliged to go to school to learn wisdom. It's a, so the paintings, are shown in the in the documentary show how a person who has he doesn't know what's a pencil what what's a brush what's a, and he, he found a, he, it's his materials from scratch in the countryside and he painted painted marvelous works of art mm. well it's well, you compare Asila to New York, you can compare those ceilings to La Madonna, to, to Mona Lisa, for instance, you know. It's, it's the same knowledge, but it's interpreted in a different way, that, you know. That's a strong statement. If you can compare Asila to New York, you can compare the painted ceilings to, to, to Mona, Mona Lisa. Lisa. Why not? <laughs> Why not, of course. Tran Transculturalism at his best, at its best. Well, anyway, my, my final uh, word is I'm happy to, to have uh, through sound relationship between Shalom and I and Luis and I. It's fantastic. This is the new technology, you know, makes, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, this, it's great. The idea of a reunion is such a wonderful idea. Of and uh, so, yeah, I just would say, you know, one of the things that I realized when I just landed in Morocco was uh, that we're really, literally, New York and Morocco are in the same uh, latitude, I guess. And, you know, the wave of the ocean is going back and forth between us and, you know, his work and I think, uh, you know, the kind of the mysticism that you see in the, those cave paintings, uh, the uh, moss paintings, and I'm thinking about cave paintings too, but, in, uh, you know, just the need to make an image somehow, to find what you can from nature and make an image of nature. It's just something that's in us. But uh, I think just sort of the interconnectedness of things, looking at nature as uh, something that unites us all, and, uh, keeping a certain kind of, uh, well, Malady is a great humanist, I, you know, would say, besides being an educator, he's done so much for the whole world and, you know, starting in his home to educate people, you know, through action, and through his own work and through his uh, support of so many artists. And um, so, well, I, I can tell you a little story. In late 80s, I think six, 86 or 87, I was invited to, to lecture at the, uh, Duke University, North Carolina. So my first contact with students, I brought up uh, 
the world map. And with the ruler, I draw a line, a pa like a parallel. Mm. And Durham, North Carolina, was corresponding to one, one town in Morocco. I don't remember whether it was Rabat, Fez, or Marrakesh, just to make the students you know, aware that we are on the same parallel. The sun goes over our head, the same parallel. And that's, you know, it's so, you know, this is like an, an anecdote. How you see it? It's the same anecdote. Anecdotes. <laughs> okay. If I could, uh, if I could just throw in a few, a few observations here. Oh, I think that we are living in a time when people who are motivated by fear really are promoting hard borders, hard boundaries and the separations between humanity and human beings. And the period that Malehi and Shalom and I were working together was a period of really trying to, uh, like hearkening back to uh, Morocco's traditional uh, historical role of being a, a place that receives, uh, you know, people and cultures openly. And so I think that, you know, this reminds us now that we, you know, people of like minds really have to fight hard to maintain open borders, maintain an open heart, and really help to uh, I help all people in, in the world to identify with their own humanity. And, um, and that will, will keep us moving forward. So um, your waves, Malehi, will continue. They are eternal. <laughs> well, and, uh, and that rhythm of life, you know, that you are representing in your work, um, I think has been a blessing and an inspiration for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you so much. The waves never go without coming back. <laughs> so if we have any question or observation yeah. from the audience, I think we, we have some, some time for it. Just in case uh, anybody's curiosity or Or maybe not. Maybe we It sometimes takes people a few minutes to get warmed up and actually ask questions. So we'll give them a few minutes. Um, but I can I can throw something in, which I've been thinking about while um, we've been having, but while we've been listening to this amazing discussion. And Luis, I'm so happy you're here. It makes it really special. Um, and it's also a very timely reminder to curators of, of this generation, because obviously we, you know, Murad and I worked together at the Tate, bringing international art into the collection. Um, and, and, you know, like every generation, you think you're doing it for the first time. Um, and it's, it's actually humbling to be reminded, actually, that your generation did so much more. And how short institutional memory is, and how short urban memory is. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot more work to be done, I think, um, in terms of cataloging and archiving and, and working with the personalities who were not only circulating in the 60s, but perhaps also circulating outside of, uh, you know, the kind of known spaces. And I think Asila possibly feels like a space where, where we should kind of uh, pay more attention and see who was there and, and what other networks were produced um, in that space. Um, I had a question around um, teaching because I'm struck by the fact that both uh, Shalom and Malehi have been obviously well-known influential pedagogues. And, and what I've been hearing as you speak is that a lot of that actually happens outside the classroom. Um, and I thought this might be an interesting opportunity to hear from Mr. Malehi about um, the Casablanca Art School, uh, the use of the camera specifically as a tool, um, and also, um, you know, this kind of integration of art and life um, that is so important to him. Well, uh, thank you, you brought this uh, point. During my teaching at the Casablanca School of Art, I introduced the, the, the department of uh, photography, you know, so. We're talking 1964. 64, but once back from, from there. 
uh, when I was in New York, I have a, I was attending some some courses at Columbia University School of General Studies. There was a, a course given by a, by a photographer at that time was very known Hattersley, who used to run the one of those who used to publish popular photography magazine. Once I was at the, the class to, to learn how to, to put the, the, the negative in the developer and the, I learned about the, the terminology, the hypo, the, everything that concerns, you know, how to, to make from a negative to a positive. So in that classroom, I discovered that with, with our group who were for photography, some students in psychology. And then I asked them, what do you have to do with uh, photography? And you are in, in majoring in, uh, in psychology. psychology. I said, well, psychology, because our uh, <clears throat> professor uh, suggests to us to, to take courses of photography, because through photography, you can, you can discover and, uh, and meet uh, through human behavior, you know, so you, you, you freeze the behavior of the people so you can go. So it was to me like a, a sort of a revelation. So once back in Casablanca at the fine art, in my senior class in painting, some students, they had the difficulty to express themselves. They had difficulty to, 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 to explain what they, what they do with this design, what they have done. So I... Uh, suggested to my colleague and director of that time, Mr. Farid Belkai, as one of the most prominent modern artists, now he's gone. I said, why don't we open a, a dark room at the, at the school? So we opened the dark room. We, we bought five enlargers and a dozen of cameras. Most of our students were, you know, low, low income. They couldn't buy cameras. So we give the camera and they start, you know, Taking photography, so how this is the way how photography I I I used the dark room as a mean to bring students more to the work they are doing sometimes without knowing hundred percent the meaning for of what they you know design is very is very free very abstract you know it doesn't speak but even even when the 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 designer does the design sometimes is missing meaning. So this, so, so this was the, the 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 value of putting photo photography and opening a dark room to students. Those students they used to when I came to the fine art school in Casablanca, they used to to learn drawing from uh, plaster fragments, you know, statues and classical. I said no 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 no. No, we have our uh, academic items that are the, the, the craftsmen, what people produce. We have a, a very high and valuable tradition of jewelry and silver in the southern part of Morocco. Uh, the, the, the work of fab, the fabrics, what is uh, uh, textile, uh, carpets and so on. And, uh, wood carving. So I made a big enlarging, enlarging photographs of items, and those were the uh, studies of draw, do, drawing documentary. So those were my models. At the moment. So if you happen to know, we, are, we, we used to produce a magazine at the fine art school called Maghreb Art. This magazine, we have done three issues. And in this magazine, it shows, this was in 65, 66, how we, we put our uh, popular art in Morocco, the role it plays to, to push students towards modern expression in design and applying uh, this art in architecture and understand architecture, what that means, knowing that Throughout history, the architecture in the Islamic world has carries a lot of ornaments. You cannot see a building without the, the 
the artistic writing of an artist, you know, it was very important. Lack of museums, we have traditional architecture carries a lot of artistic elements, you know. So, so eventually photography was not only a way to produce uh, self-consciousness and help the young st Moroccan students to express their subjectivity, because you said that at that time, the Moroccan students of the Casablanca Art School was not easy for them to basically speak their mind or express themselves, but photography was also a way of documenting these incredible arts and crafts that eventually would become the new reference and even for drawing as you brought the jewels and the tapestries as a pattern for even in the drawing class to replace the Greek or Roman uh, sculptures and busts yes, that for were a, for a period yeah. for a certain period I mean at least at the beginning when you arrived at the school yeah we have a question from Murtaza, but before I give it over to Murtaza, um, um, actually he's asked me to read the question out. But before I do that, Shalom, did you want to add anything? Thanks. Um, well, in the uh, fall semester, I teach a course. Um, it used to be, well, it, the whole course is outside. We start with, um, there may be 20 students. We have a circle and do Tai Chi. And then we do, uh, we study basically Andy Goldsworthy's work. And so we're using um, objects from nature to make uh, ephemeral artworks on campus. So uh, we work, I call the woods our gallery and there's the road through the woods so people can see the work. But uh, the students are working with natural materials and often uh, my colleagues say, why are your students so happy? <laughs> We're outside, <laughs> you know, and some of them grow up in the suburbs in New Jersey and they're afraid to be outside. And so I think, you know, uh, to go back to what Malahi was saying, photography, film, it's always kind of about something, you know, you have the technology and then like he keeps talking about communicating and which is not, you, you know, often a word you hear in the fine arts world. But it's, uh, you know, it's teaching people to look through this lens that it amplifies nature, if that's what you're looking at in interesting ways. And I think it brings us back to our uh, source again, and uh, to look at nature through our own, you know, whatever medium, but especially through something like photography or film. So. Thank you. So I'll come to Murtaza's question and then we have another one from Mariam. Um, Murtaza's is about the Bronx Museum exhibition. What was the response, critical and general audience to the show at the Bronx Museum in 1984? And this is a great uh, actually parallel that he's drawn. I was struck by similarities between Mr. Malehi's work and the wild style of graffiti emerging in that borough at that time. The strong graphic quality, iconicity and flatness, the use of commercially available paints, the use of spray, and also the underlying ethos of democratizing art through its presentation in public space on city walls. So he's I think, asking. I would, I would there's a I, yes. maybe, maybe Luis Cancel was going to say something. Uh, so. Yes, and, and so I, I think that that uh, person who posed that question really um, put their finger on something that uh, Melehi's exhibition was very timely in the sense that this is an artist who was creating, you know, spray. His, I mean, all his paintings are spray painted, right? So they're spray painted, flat. There is a real, um, real you know, and yet there's a fluidity to them as well. So locally in other words when i say locally meaning the, the the residents who came and saw the exhibition were it resonated very strongly for them um and i believe that you know and it was always a little bit difficult to get some of the critics to come up uh to visit the bronx museum but i, I did be, i do believe that his exhibition did uh did get some critical uh, you know positive reviews um, and so, you know, we were really um, gratified 
by the feedback that we got at the time. Malay, you were going to say something? Oh, sorry. No, no, it, it was something about the question that uh, and the observation that uh, the, the person has started before about, about my, my work, the flatness and the industrial materials. Well, that, that was done on, on a purpose because, uh, you know, uh, uh, so I, I happen to be in Europe at, at the decline of academic teaching. You know, the, the, the European academies, they were, you know, losing their tradition, you know. And, uh, and today we cannot say I, I am going to Rome to, to, to study in the fine art academy of Rome. It, it doesn't happen, you know, because the, the interest of young people in art has, has changed. Well, myself, uh, the use of industrial paint and uh, regular, I mean, to, to, to bring the, the, the art occupation in, in other materials that are not really noble for the academic teaching, you know? Because the academy, the academic and classical work has sort of, you know, of uh, aura that people cannot uh, transgress the community, transgress it. Uh, to overcome. Overcome. But my, my, my preoccupation, just to be uh, short, is, is to be uh, sympathetic to the, to the proletarian society. I want simple people realize my work of art, you see? And that's, and that's a way to, to, to bring art and people to meet, to match each other, you see? And if you, if you recall, by, your, by the way, uh, Shalom has took a very beautiful picture of us, me and my assistant, you know, painting and preparing the painting work of art. And it was just a game. And they, and they start playing drums, you know. And <laughs> I think that's one the best, the best, you know, the best view in the documentary, you know, to to explain uh, an art artistic occupation or yeah. or pre preoccupation, not the very aristocratic, mostly serious, the ivory tower artist who, who does it its own painting that is going to be meaningful to society. That, that scene, making the painting and drumming on the painting and, uh, and having fun, that's the best way to, 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 to communicate with art, by art, to, to the population. Yes. Yes. That's, that's what you often call art as an act of communication, right? Yes, it's uh, it, it's which also has to do with yeah, graffiti and, and, because and, graffiti and, artists yeah, also but, do art as yeah, a communication. When the layman see how the, my paintings are done, there is a sort of demystification. This business of art, you know, mm. this kind. Of, well, it's a, it art is science, it's philosophy, it's poetry, it's everything, you know. But it's hard for people to think that art is everything. That's why art, art, it's not spread out as it should be. There's a question uh, that actually- They are afraid of art sometimes. They don't want to go through. So that's why you would try to demystify yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's, it's a sort of, uh, it's a political behavior. It's, uh, it's a sort of- uh, pro Yeah, yeah, it's a militant action, you know. Mostly. Right. Yeah. Just like the so, graffiti artist that you were oh, somehow. Today, it's street art is, uh, is, is that. You were doing street art. Yeah, yeah. street art in the world. Thank <clears> you. <throat> that leads in an interesting way to the next question, which is actually about uh, Islamic mysticism. Um, so Mariam is asking if you took inspiration from Islamic mysticism in the artwork. And I'm just going to, also going to take or read out the next question now, because I know that we are running out of time. So um, 
if you could also address Murad the question from Tima, uh, if there is a publication being planned on the history of the Casablanca Art School. So I'll just repeat the question from Mariam, um, which is for Mr. Malehi, um, asking about inspiration from Islamic mysticism in particular. Well, uh, I it's, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a long question, but could could say two words. Uh, uh, what 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 happened in my mental laboratory is is to mix Islam and Zen Buddhism. You see, uh, th it's we are dealing with the window that opens both sides, not only one side. The Islamic culture has a lots of things to, to, to say. And the, the, thing, the fact that I, I was, you know, in, not influenced, I was occupied by these two thoughts. One is that the ex extreme Asia, that's Zen Buddhism, you know, and Islam, it's, well, Islam, Islam, it's a broad field, you know, Where, when you are born in, in Islam, I wonder if you are really Islamic or not, you know, that's a big, big question, you see, uh, to understand, the, well, there is what we call in, in, in Islam, the Sufism, it's 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 uh, like would say uh, like a vehicle, a religious vehicle. Sufism is really a philosophy, is an, an attitude, is a way to 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 go to look for the truth, you know. And the Zen Buddhism is also a, a tool or vehicle to push you to to reach the truth, and you never get, you never meet, and that's the that's the beautiful thing about. Uh, Sufism and Zen Buddhism. Wow, because there's also that point in the film where you talk about the artisan, the craftsman, and you say that the, per the, the perfection lies in imperfection, in the sense that it can never equal God's perfection, and therefore it becomes perfect within its own imperfection towards God, in a way. Yes, yes. You said it. I don't you said it in the film. I'm just repeating. <laughs> That's true. I was just going to bring up that bit in the film and see if Shalom had any any final comments. Uh, uh, well, I'm very interested now in knowing about uh, that you were influenced by Zen, which I consider myself a Jubu and have been practicing Zen. Uh, meditation for since I was in high school. So uh, that's really amazing. And the idea of, you know, the, that kind of flow too uh, in, into Zen Buddhism. Uh, a jubu. No, but a uh, jubu. <laughs> you know, the shalom, it's, you know, you, you started about Zen and I say, but we never spoke about it. And Zen is that. Then it's something you can hardly explain. You know, you should forget about it to get it. This is this is philosophy. <laughs> but uh, you know, my first reading was in 1960 by by, by Alan Watts. Uh, the book by Alan, Alan Watts, Watts on Zen. But at the same time, I read about Krishnamurti. Yeah. I, I didn't mention before because I started. The preoccupation by the Americans in the early 60s is Kumar Swami. But Krishna Murti is also a person, personage, I didn't a, person, know that a person that that means something. And also, Krishna Murti was more close to the Occidental life and the Occidental action. He used to have used to lecture in Switzerland mostly and in England, and they had a school. So a lot of students. Uh, I, I, you, uh, Louis, you remember uh, Krishna Riddhi? Yes, oh, I know Krishna, well, knew Krishna Riddhi very well. Krishna Riddhi. Yeah, he was with us in Yes. Yeah. So he, he is one of, of uh, students that uh, studied at uh, Krishna Murti's school in India. Now that knows about that, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. I think we need to have another uh, session on, on these intersecting art histories because uh, 
I've recently gone back to, to read Kumaraswamy. And so I can see so many threads connect, but unfortunately we have to let um, uh, Murad go. So Murad, do you just want to answer perhaps the last question around the pub, whether there is a publication? I mean, the I mean, to be honest, if you want to continue, I'm okay, of course. It's just that I'm doing another book launch in the other side of the city in, in half an hour, but... Right. But anyway, so the book that we are preparing indeed about the, the whole scope of the Casablanca Art School, which basically begins in 1962, uh, when Farid Belkahia was appointed at, as the director of the Casablanca Art School and would shift the school's history and pedagogy, and even more with uh, Mr. Melehi's arrival in 64, and then continues for us as we conceive, as we are conceiving this uh, book until 1978, a precisely with the first year, with the inauguration of the Asila Festival of the Arts, that somehow becomes uh, the, the end of the story for 60s and 70s and begins a new story that continued to the, to the Bronx Museum of Arts um, exhibition. So ours would be between 1962 and 1978, and that's the broad historical time involving exhibition history, artist interviews, archival essays, new essays, putting all this knowledge in, in new perspective that we are hoping to, with a very diverse range of authors contributing to it. And we hope to, to publish this book, um, inshallah, by next spring. We hope so. So, uh, and, you know, next publication from Zaman Books uh, and and we hope to to tell you about it in in due course. Well, we're very pleased to announce uh, for those of you who are in the UAE that the exhibition has been extended um, until the twenty first of November. So, if you haven't had a chance to come and see it, or if in, indeed if you would like to come and spend a bit more time, um, especially with the archival material, we'd love to see you at the Avenue. Um, and of course, this, this does give us, uh, uh, give us the opportunity to do a bit more programming, so we'll keep you posted. But I just want to thank all of you on behalf of Al Serkal. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Malehi. It was really wonderful to have this hour with you. And, and uh, Shalom, thanks for joining us. Um, and, you know, I, feel, I really feel like Africa and Asia and, and all points in between are, are, are in the house tonight. So um, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Louis. So see you at the next episode. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Take please. care, everybody. Thank you so much. Mr. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. For all of you. Thank you. Great seeing you, Mohammed. Great yeah. seeing you. Bye. See you in the so outer we'll, space. We'll see each other. I hope with Louis sometime. You know. Yeah, we need to do another space. Yeah. We have a big apartment in New York. Anytime you're you're there. Thank you. Thank we'll you. all show up. That's uh, that's uh, too generous. <laughs> <and> <laughs> But I, you know, the thought of all of you hanging out in Soho in Krishna Reddy's studio is going to stay with me. <laughs> many, many days there, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Louise. It Have was a lovely, great day. lovely to electronically bye. meet you. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye.